podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of the I Newspaper and iNews.co.uk. I've got George Belshaw here for the first of our Wimbledon dailies. Um, I, 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 we used to call them Wimble Pods. Uh, that was a hard word to say, especially at like 12 o'clock at night after a couple of beers. Uh, we then started going mini pods, and, and now I don't know what it is. But it's a Wimbledon day one review, and I'm delighted that it's not just me talking into my phone while huffing and puffing my way through the streets of Paris. Uh, George has somehow managed to conquer his technology. Yeah, and the listeners pleased, it's not just me either, which I was dubbed as uh, the new Alan Partridge a few times when I've <laughs> on my own before. Yeah, I... I don't like to agree with that, George, but I, I know where they're coming from, I'm afraid. Um, I, I do think you do an excellent job, I have to say, James. I'll say this to you <laughs> privately. But when I listen to your one, one-man one bands, and I know you had a lot of experience from it from your kind of uh, radio, radio career, days, yeah. but I think it sounds quite natural and you're good at filling the time, whereas I sound like I'm thinking of something to say and trying to make it quaint and interesting, <laughs> and then I suddenly sound a bit partridge the whole way through. <laughs> That's very kind of you, George. My head shall explode. Uh, just as I thought it did today when, uh, for the second time this summer, someone came up to me and said, are you James Gray? I love the podcast. Um, thanks, Miles. Uh, made my day. Hope you had a really great day. Um, Miles was on number one court. And I said, actually, I think even though you haven't got Kyrgios and Goffa anymore, you might have quite a good day. And actually, as it turned out, number one was definitely the place to be as compared to centre court. Uh, and it's on number one court, George, where I want to start with the last match of the day, the traditional way of doing things to start at the end. Uh, Sophia Kennan beat Coco Goff 6-4, 4-6, 6-2, but easily the match of the day, as um, our dear friend Simon Briggs of The Telegraph pointed out to me. He said there aren't many matches of the day today, but this is definitely one. Um, it had quality, it had needle, it, it had a, a, a swing to it, a momentum shifts. And in the end, Sophia Kennan, who came through qualifying, uh, the former, of course, Grand Slam champion. Well, she still is a Grand Slam champion, I suppose. You never lose that. Um, but the 2020 Australian Open fi- uh, winner, the French Open finalist that year as well. She's been down. She's definitely on the way back up again, George. I mean, what a story for Sophia Kennan to, to come through qualifying and then, and then win a round. I mean, I, I felt a little bit sheepish yesterday suggesting this should have been on centre court and I I really wish I'd gone in on it a bit harder James I'm, I'm, I <laughs> thought this was a good match but but seriously I mean the match that went on centre court rather than this was absolute nonsense yeah it was as bad as I said it would be and this is someone who's burst through here people know who it is versus a former Grand Slam champion it doesn't matter what state either of them are in that's got interest it's it's immediately a, a kind of big match and as you say there's that bit of needle as well. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think Wimbledon have already dropped the ball on that. So I'll, I'll stick the knife in early on. So I'm sure we'll be doing that a few times this fortnight. <laughs> well, I, have to say, um, George, George, I have to say, George, that has been most of my job today, has been sticking the knife in on Wimbledon. <laughs> Usually we wait till the second week, but I'm afraid that they've served up a few half volleys today and I've tucked into them outside the off stump. So, yeah, well, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't get over it. I mean, I, I was trying to be a bit within my shell yesterday because we had a lot more serious conversations about actual kind of moral and ethical issues but seeing as we're on a tennis tennis drive today James it was nonsense but yeah anyway look from a more serious perspective it was a really good match um I think it's a bit of a sad indictment of where Coco Goff is as well um I, I think we can't downplay that I know Kenin has been coming into a little bit of form had a couple of wins over the last couple of months but this is a match you, you couldn't dream of Coco Goff losing 12 months ago it wouldn't mm. even be on the agenda she would should be at two and two and I, I hate to say it but I, I kind of feel like this is all <laughs> emblematic of of the top rivalry she's been trying to create with Fiontech. I, I just feel she's been blown away by someone she's lost in her head this idea she's going to be the best in the world she's she knows she's not now and mm. I, I think we're genuinely looking at someone who isn't going to come close to fulfilling their potential. I just don't see it now. And, I, and that's so harsh for a 19-year-old. But Sviontek is close in age. She's infinitely better. And Goff is getting worse. And there are players catching up with Sviontek. And she's getting left behind. And th- this is a bad, bad result on a surface that you're kind of hoping she was going to bounce back on. 
Yeah, I, I don't always understand it when Calvin says, you know, the game's moved past someone or, you know, that the, the game has moved on since since they've not made any progress because I don't have a good tennis eye. I am not a, I don't really play. I'm not a professional tennis coach. But Coco Goff, it's so kind of clear and plain that she has not made progress. And, you know, she may have made some progress, but the graph, the gradient is so shallow that I think the improvement of other players has moved past her. And... You know, Sophia Kennan, just to illustrate the kind of depths and the heights, as I say, she made French Open final and won the Australian Open in the same year. Um, she was at world number four in August 2020. Uh, she was world number 412 in August 2022. She <laughs> was world number 128 at the beginning of Wimbledon. Live ranking, she is now up to 94 um, so back inside the top hundred, just behind She's Jody, back, baby. Just behind Jody Burridge, incidentally, who had a very good win today as well yes. um, against Coco Goss' former doubles partner, Katie McNally. A um, little shout out to her. Um, yeah, I, it is a real shame to see Coco Goff kind of so. And you know, she didn't really have answers afterwards, and, and that's kind of inevitable. You you actually never really expect players to have answers. Like sometimes they can be like, "Oh yeah, I did this or did that," but you know, how do you say to someone, "Your game's a mess. What on earth do you do?" Um, and I, I don't really know. I don't really know what she does. Uh, and, and look, we in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big a mess, is it? I mean, she's still been a kind of steady top ten player, and she's mm. a nineteen year old. It it it's set in the context of what it felt she was going to be. And you know, someone who comes here gets the fourth round as a fifteen year old after taking out Venus Williams in round one. That gets you pretty excited. It's someone who, even before that, we were excited about because we knew what she was doing at the junior level. It's someone you felt the way they were speaking, they belonged there. There wasn't going to be this problem. And the one thing we've just always said was, you know, the forehands just need some work. And that ain't happened. I, I mm. don't understand how it's not happened. And I'm not, I'll let Calvin get on his soapbox with it later when we do a, a kind of fuller one because he'll, he'll, he'll sit here and say, I'd fix that in three weeks. <laughs> but, you know, but I don't understand it because, you know, I don't have the technical knowledge he does of what exactly needs to to happen with that. But it, it feels crazy to me that's not happened for such a fundamental. Um, And she still has great attributes. She's still a great athlete. She's still got a great backhand. But it, but people know her, her issue. It's like Sissa Pass's backhand. That's the, that's the shot I kind of compare it to on the men's tour in terms mm. of someone people thought might be a Grand Slam champion but had such an obvious weekend weakness but Sissipas has still got a good forehand like I still think Sissipas is more likely to win a slam than Goff at the minute from the mm. perspective of you know the four you can get away with a bad backhand to a degree because you're going kind to of be spending more time off of the dot trading off the forehand side a bad forehand I don't know I, don't, I can't think of a single slam winner who's had a bad forehand I don't think that exists. Uh, no. You know who the, there are a lot of kind of parallels with here um, between Coco Goff and Felix auger scene. Like the same kind of someone we mm. thought would be real natural going into the, the senior game, really talented, speaks very well. You know, I sat down with Felix last week and had a really interesting conversation about all sorts of things with him. And um, actually, I think I might have seen today's quite poor defeat to Michael Moe. And that's no disrespect to Michael Moe. Uh, coming but you know he's someone we all think could and sh maybe should be a grand slam winner but the evidence that we've been presented with over the last couple of years is actually starting to make us reverse that position you know when you consider that he went quarterfinal semi-final quarterfinal in consecutive slams when you consider that he you know has been top 10 for quite some time or there are thereabouts anyway top 20 certainly to then kind of not figure at slams in any meaningful way is is pretty staggering. And, and okay, Coco Goff has had more consistency than that, but it's still still pretty remarkable. Um, on the flip side, there is a positive story here, which is, as I mentioned, the incredible comeback of Sevilla Kennan. Um, I mean, what a fighter. I remember when Rick Macy came on the podcast, George, he said that she was like the most fearsome seven-year-old he'd ever met. Um, and I, I really saw some of that on court today, like the fist pumps in Goff's face. She she didn't take it well that Goff had said, I think, over the weekend that since the last time they played, Goff felt she had got better and that 
that Kenin hadn't. Um, I, I don't think she took that terribly well. Uh, so <laughs> I, I wonder if there was a bit of needle there. I mean, Kenin's such a a fascinating story in so many ways. I mean, I remember watching her in 2019 at the French Open beating Serena Williams. And as you said, it was the thing that came through about her. I mean, she's obviously a quality tennis player. I'm not saying she's not a, a very good tennis player. But the thing that came through more than anything was, as you've just said, it was what she brought to the court in terms of that intensity, that that fierce desire to win. And I think that that sometimes makes it even stranger when someone like this has such a huge drop off. Like, you know, it, it, it probably is just that age old story. They win a slam and then they kind of struggle to find. find yeah. The, do, again, Dominic, that team, drive. Dominic team talks about it quite well um, about, yeah, you know, hitting that, that kind of wall. But, but team, I, I don't have him down as the same character as, as Kenan in many ways. I think key, team's a bit of a runner in terms mm. of he'll keep going. He's been kind of drilled. Whereas I think Kenan is a natural inner scrapper. Like she's she's born to fight and hunger. You know, you can tell that about her character. And that to me makes it a bit weirder in some ways that she almost didn't, that this has lasted so long, this barren period. Like it's understandable to have a drop off, but I think something this this big for someone like that is quite strange to me. I thought she'd rediscover this a little bit quicker. And I'm pleased to see her back because I think she is an interesting character. I I, I don't think she'll ever be the most popular player in world tennis, to be honest. Like, I don't... I think she'll rub people up the wrong way and I'm sure people great. will be naturally upset by this fault. <laughs> but that's bloody great. But yeah. as we know, that that that's a tick in our book, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, um, So, yes, yeah, great to have her back and a big result for her to kind of re-announce herself to a big public against a player who, okay, on paper right now, the way Goff's been playing, maybe not the world's biggest surprise, um, but to the kind of public who aren't follow, following tennis 52 weeks of the year, they'll be looking at this like, oh my God, Coco Goff lost. And, oh, it's a fallen Grand Slam champion. Is it a huge redemption arc? Let's see how she goes on. Mm. The draw is, she can take this forward now. There's good opportunities in this draw. Yeah, well, she's obviously nicked the, the draw of a seed, which is what we always say you should be uh, trying to do. Um, she, she does have a slightly tricky next round, which is uh, Wang Jin Yu. Uh, who came through against Storm Hunter, the best name in tennis, without a doubt, um, 6-3, 6-1. But yeah, I mean, she is in a wide open section of the draw. Okay, we'll have to go potentially go and play Shrontek in the quarterfinals, but if Sophia Kennan makes the quarterfinals, it's like, that's, that's, that's you know, that's job done. Um, that that kind of section now, it, with Jodie Burridge winning, um, with uh, Lena Svitolina beating Venus Williams... It really could be quite. It could be anyone coming out of that second section to play Shrontek in the quarterfinals. Um, George, were you disappointed by Venus Williams against Svitolina by any chance? Well, no, because I said that she'd win in straight sets. So from our prediction <laughs> game, I was very happy. Um, but, <laughs> but I was uh, the main thing I'm disappointed about, James, is I didn't back Svitolina in fantasy because I think she's going to reach the quarterfinals. To be honest, mm. and I, I knew she was bloody going to do it, and I, I've fallen for the trap of letting people be like oh but it's venus no yeah she's 43 and she's barely bloody played what's wrong with you george stick with what you were gonna do <laughs> but um... in fairness in fairness <laughs> um like for the for the three games that venus played before she slipped and hurt her knee which i should also point out a bit like when cena serena tore her hamstring here yeah. she was already very heavily strapped and yeah. venus's right knee was also very heavily strapped um, and look, I mean, she could have just injured it anyway, but th th you know, th there's a kind of there's two things going on there, not just one. But before that, she was hitting the ball very well. Yeah, and look, I, I know there will be narratives pushed here about, oh, the grass is too slippy, or whatever. Look what happened to Serena a few years ago. Look what happened. Right. Okay, that's fine. Watch Novak Djokovic play a match, first match at Wimbledon every year. He slips over about six times. Mm. It doesn't kill him. There are some players who have played about six times in the year before they arrive at Wimbledon. There's Venus has played about three times yeah. in a calendar year since coming to Wimbledon. I'm sorry, that sort of thing happens and causes you more problems. 
if you're not a full-time athlete and calvin would lob that at kyrios yeah we have to lob that at them as well you know that's and, the I, same and in fairness in fairness venus kind of kind of agrees with you on that like she said grass is inherently going to be slippery you're going to fall at some point it was just bad luck for me uh, she said i started the match perfectly i was literally killing it mm-hmm. then i got killed by the grass and she laughed it was the only laugh she really had for the whole press conference she was well to begin with very monosyllabic and actually credit to molly McElway, uh for sort of getting her to kind of open up a bit more and, and give us a little bit more um, but yeah, she was understandably pretty gutted. I mean, yeah, you're right, George. She is 43, but she also is one of the most competitive people going and obviously bloody hates losing. She obviously thinks she's a better player than Alina Svitolina. Like, she 100% thinks well, she's she certainly better. was. Yeah, yeah, well, quite. Um, and yeah, it was pretty gutted to uh, to lose that. Uh, the other match was on there, Centre... Um, Go on. Well, as I've not seen the press conference, James, I was just wondering, was there any questions about the end for venus is it a u.s open is it i'm sure she didn't actually answer it but i'm just wondering if that that came up on the agenda yeah i mean uche um uche amako asked whether she'd be at flushing meadows and she said well i gotta figure it out i'm kind of in shock um still processing it she said in pre-tournament that she did want to be you know she's like oh i'm focusing on this but oh you know she kind of was quite glowing about it i i think it's Virtually certain she'll be at the US Open. I think she'll try and come back to Wimbledon next year. I guarantee she doesn't want that to be the end. Um, like that, that would just not be acceptable to her. unless she has like a Serena-style US Open run. You know, where she wins a couple of matches and has a big night, where, where it might be acceptable to go out on that sort of note. Like, okay, it wouldn't be the Wimbledon goodbye she wanted, but you know that they, they are quite similar characters in in some ways. I know they're not totally similar, but. I imagine they sh- they share a lot of kind of um, you know what's the word principles on things and and share a lot of the same kind of ethos and I do wonder whether a good night in New York would be would be absolutely fine for her but I don't know she she's such an enigma I find her much more of an enigma than Serena because Venus gives less away and I'm sure that's deliberate and I'm sure it's older sibling syndrome yeah and I know. I think to be fair, Jay's. I mean, I've, I've I've often kind of reflected on this. I mean, I I start kind of covering tennis in 2016, 2017. I mean, this mm. this is the back end of someone who's been on the tour for more Decades. than twenty years, basically I your mean, whole life. Yeah, they, you know, it, it's kind of unfair for me to judge the press conferences at this stage, which have been, as you've kind of just described, as long as I've been involved. Um, you know, I'm sure she was. A lot more engaged earlier in the career. I think she's been a very interesting character for a long time. There's been a lot of water under the bridge and things that were far out data that I'm sure have led to this path of, you know, mm. apathy basically. Yeah. Uh, on both sides now, I think it, you know it's barely worth commenting on because what's the point? She's been great for tennis. She doesn't really need to say much for people to still come and watch her and find it interesting. Obviously, it's a bit of a shame for people like you and me who come into the sport being like sort of in awe when you first get there like oh my yeah. god it's venus williams then you go to a first conference and you're like oh god was it, was it always like that <laughs> <laughs> did i do something what's going on but, yeah i mean know. i i asked venus her, her first question today and uh yeah she i was i stumbled a little bit i'm sure i've asked her a question before i haven't seen her in a few years obviously but um yeah i was definitely like this because no one wanted to ask the first question. Because literally she, as people probably may or may not know, the moderator asked the first question these days. And it's usually just like, you know, tell us, bad luck, tell us how it went. And so Faye Andrews, who's brilliant, um, who works on secondment for uh, for the tournament. And she said, Venus, tough day today. Just give us your initial thoughts on the match. And Venus said, I'm just ready for questions. And I think we all just went, oh, no, <laughs> you oh, no. And so, like, Faye was like, okay, questions. And I was like, right, I'm going to take one for the team here. It, it's also a lot more of a, a kind of American athlete thing, I think. I mean, we get it occasionally. You know, like, Erling Haaland's done the odd interview, hasn't he, where he, he's a bit kind of one-word answers. Yeah. But it is a little less common over here. But you know, I've seen quite a few kind of NFL or... Um, 
to, or is it where they're kind of make a point or whatever? But... To be honest, I think it comes down to the kind of contractual situations. Like, it, yeah. it's very rare that like athletes in the UK where, who generally have a bit more power, yeah. yeah, are, are kind of forced to go and do that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I don't work in American sports, but yeah, certainly looking at American sports, like. It t- that you do get times when people are, people are coerced into it. Famous, famously, uh, Marshall and Lynch hated doing yeah, press conferences yeah, yeah. and would just answer every question with "I'm just here, so I don't get fined." Um, yeah. Which, which actually, you know, when Skittles then paid him an awful lot of money to do an advert, uh, he he didn't mind talking then. Funny that. Anyway, um, right, let's move on. Uh, Novak Djokovic beat Pedro Kashin to open centre court as the defending champion. Six three six three. 7-6. This match was delayed, George, by 88 minutes for rain. But, George, we've got a roof. How on earth was there a rain delay, I hear you ask? Well, um, they they tried to keep playing in the drizzle, which the, then they stopped and got the covers on and closed the roof. Then they took the covers off to let the court dry, but when your roof is closed, of course, it's more humid, which means the court dries more slowly. So then after about half an hour or 40 minutes, like Djokovic and Kashin came out again and started like wiping their hands on the floor and it was still too damp. And then so they all go back in again and um, referee Jerry Armstrong's out there stroking the grass and then the ground staff come out with leaf blowers, um, including Mikey Hinks, who works with me at the eye, one of his best mates uh, is ground staff on centre court. So we were taking lots of photos of Gibbo um, who I would also count as a friend in fairness. I've met him enough times now. Um, to, out there with a leaf blower. Um, you know, Novak Djokovic came out with a towel and started trying to dry the court with that. I mean, he was incredibly relaxed about the whole thing. But it is a bit of a <laughs> farce that, like, they've got a very expensive roof and they literally didn't hit a ball under it. Like, by the time the court had dried out, it had stopped raining. They opened the roof again and carry on with the match an hour and a half later. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's descending into fast. I mean, Djokovic is obviously re- relaxed because he knows he could probably play on one leg and reach the final of this tournament. <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> um, <clears throat> but I'm sure if it was a more stressful environment, he, w- he wouldn't have uh, been quite so chipper about it unless he happened to be two sets down. Um, but yeah, look, it's it, it, the roof is a funny thing, really. I mean, it's... I think it's made things a lot better in some ways. But as we also move towards this desperation for a kind of a night session sort of thing at Wimbledon and added in kind of these half hour slots between matches, I think it has caused a lot of bother as well, actually, at at these events. And, you know, even even at a player level, I remember one of the first years it was kind of kicking around with Nadal and Djokovic, you know, it was raining to start the match and Djokovic, and then they had to close it for the night and Djokovic wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't let it be open the next day because it was in full sun, you know, which is completely within his rights. Mm. And I, I think that's absolutely fine from a competitive advantage perspective, but you do just think sometimes tennis like just really finds the weirdest ways to cause controversy with things that should make total I don't know sense why it's always tennis and, and golf <laughs> is a bit the same maybe it's just because they're such sort of ancient and esoteric sports that um, it, it kind of finds a way to like just be weird and controversial I don't know but anyway it didn't create too much controversy because no one fell over and Djokovic absolutely walked it and he didn't even really wasn't even that bothered about it afterwards so I... we can move on it's probably the most interesting thing we're going to have to say about Djokovic until. Well, I've got no. I think I think Jordan Thompson's going to take a set off him because Jordan Thompson's got an enormous serve and genuinely likes grass, which puts him in like the top one percent of players in the draw. That's do, that's we, just... do we consider Djokovic losing a set interesting? At what well... stage does it become interesting for Djokovic? I don't. Th- I, I genuinely don't think it becomes interesting until he's two sets and three love down <laughs> to someone. And even then, it's and it's got to be someone over the age of twenty-five, <laughs> because if yeah, it's one I, of the kids, like they're gone. <laughs> I honestly like. I, I I think the interesting thing will be: is he going to be focused enough during this tournament? Like the only thing that can slip him up, as far as I'm concerned, is him going do lally 
and losing his concentration until the final, potentially. But Well, I, I did anyway. think he was actually having a very early choke when he was down a break at the first sit-down and he was sat there with his towel in his face, sort of heaving and almost rocking. And so I asked him about it afterwards and uh, he he said no, uh, he, he just had blinded himself in the sun. He was trying to clear his... His sort of, you know, when you get that thing when you look directly in the sun, he was trying to clear it, the shadow from his eyes, he called it. Um, yeah, so I don't know whether I believed him or not, but it was it was a blooming weird thing to do. Um, may, maybe I did believe him, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I won't well, do any more Djokovic Cal- bashing. I was going to say, Cal- Calvin, if, if Calvin was here, he wouldn't. Maybe we could, maybe we could be nice to Novak and believe him tonight. Yeah, well, perhaps. Um while I remember, George, I've got some reviews that I have to read out. As you know, the rule is, if oh. you leave a five-star review, I always read it out. Ace Podcast, full of information and education, says Lozoraptor. I discovered this podcast by accident a few weeks ago. What, you like tripped and fell? Um, fast becoming one of my top favourites. The straightforward talk is my favourite aspect. I have a much better understanding of tennis structures after a few weeks of listening compared to being a decent-ish tennis fan of almost 20 years. I wish the episodes were twice weekly in at least two hours. I love hearing the trio's vents and rants about <laughs> tennis and British tennis specifically. Please keep what you're doing. It's brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Lozoraptor. Uh, two hours twice weekly. We might try one day. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, James knows how hard it is to pin me down for, a, for yeah, an hour a week. Never so. mind, Calvin. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the other one, a bit shorter, uh, Carmel Jane says, love this so much. Highlight of my morning when the Grand Slams are on. Good morning, Jane. Um, love the analysis, the insights, the gossip and the banter. Uh, we do our best. Uh, we also got a one-star review from someone who thinks we're racist and xenophobic and Novak Djokovic <laughs> bashing. Um, so I don't really know what to make of that. <laughs> Outside the reviews, James, I just wanted to say, because I know you've plugged this a little bit, but I've really enjoyed the listener survey. So I've had a little look properly through that over the last couple of weeks. And I've, I've found the feedback really useful and interesting. So I just want to say, if you, if you haven't done that yet, I'm sure James sticks it in the show notes. So yeah. yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, and we do genuinely read it and, and take it on board and try and, you know, where we can. Uh, I enjoyed someone suggesting we try and get Roger Federer on the podcast. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'll try. Um... Yeah. He's on Thunder <laughs> Court tomorrow, James, so if ever there's a time to collar him. Well, when we'll both be... Yeah, that's a good point, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, right, but yes, as I say, thank you always for getting in touch. Thanks for leaving reviews. Um, I never really understand why people leave shit reviews. Uh, it seems completely unnecessary, but... It's fine. It wasn't personal this time, so I can kind of get over it. Um, I'm going to do a very quick Brit run around, George, and then I'm going to ask you for your predictions. Um, six Brits in action today. Katie Swan lost to Belinda Bencic in straight sets, which was bad news for me because I said uh, Bencic would win in three sets. In fact, we all did. Uh, and bad you picked news. Swan, George, so particularly bad for you. Um, it was close, at least, the first set. <laughs> yes. A lot of the games went to juice, as Calvin hates when people say. Um, it, I, I watched it. It was close. Yeah, um, I mean, there were a lot of breaks. I'll give you that. And Calvin, I think, actually did say it quite well yesterday, where he thought we'd reflect on that match as Katie Swan had, had chances yeah. to, to do well, and mm. she Didn't did not take them. them. Mm. Shock. Um, Dan Evans uh, didn't finish. Uh, he was suspended bad light, but he's two sets down to Quentin Alice, which, I mean, ever is absolute, he's just having a stinker of a year. Um, but anyway. Uh, and this maybe. is next level stinker, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, know, even, mm. We have a lot of time for Dan on this, but that that is a. Yeah. That'd be a nightmare. Let's have him pull it back. Uh, the other British defeat today was Harriet Dart, who went down 6 7. Six love, six four to Diane Parry. Um, yeah. I mean, Parry's got I watched weapons. That. I watched that. And I thought Dart was playing really well, and then just I don't know. It, it, it seems to just happen every every year, doesn't it? With a lot of these kind of British players, that they have a really strong first set and they look really pumped, and then it just goes slightly wrong in the second, and the wheels mm. just just fall off. It is one of those sports that is brutal and. You know, we we just chatted about Djokovic there before. I mean, Djokovic is the best at taking the wind from out of your sails in terms of knowing that point between the end of a set and the start mm-hmm. of the next one. He, he is just so good at resetting. Whereas yeah. other players are just like, I've done it. I've won a set. I'm going to win this. And it just starts going wrong and badly. And that's probably the thing is Calvin's not here. I'll say that's the one thing I would coach into players is forget <laughs> about the rest of the set. Finish strong, start strong. Don't worry about the middle. <laughs> Jesus. Um, 
Uh, you can't see the look on George's face. It's very unmotivating. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, and I'm not basing this on any privileged knowledge, because if I was, I wouldn't say it. I think there's more going on with Harriet Dar at the moment. Like, she obviously lost her agent um, earlier this year because she was part of Andy Murray's group um, and didn't get taken mm. over to IMG. So her partner, actually, who is a uh, model, um, is also doing her kind of management. Yeah, I think he's Norwegian. Um yeah, which uh, uh, just slightly surprising, and I'm not sure is the greatest setup. She's got a coach now, but it's Colin Beecher, who is Carl Edmonds' coach, and Carl's injured at the moment, so that's not even really permanent. And just feels like she needs to get a solid team around her of the right people. And, you know, she she is a hard, bloody hard worker. Um, everyone says that about her, so maybe there is something to turn around there. Um, let's talk about the positive British stories for the day. Jodie Burridge beat Katie McAnally 6 one six three. It's her first ever Grand Slam main draw win. She's live rankings into the top 100 for the first time. She was delighted afterwards. Um, she's For people who haven't heard her talk, she's a wonderful talker. Like She's really bubbly. She's excited. Um, she, just, she talks about her dog Otto a lot um, and how she can't bring him to Wimbledon because he's too obsessed with tennis balls. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it's just a great result and... Yeah, I mean, good for her and good for Craig, her coach, who is a friend of the pod. And well, I don't know if he'll be listening because he might be too busy during the slam. But um, I'm sure he's keen to come on. So we'll get him on perhaps after Wimbledon. He can tell us the secret to Jody's success. Um, another friend of the pod, Liam Brody, also won today. Uh, beat Constant Lestienne, the enigmatic Frenchman, which seems like a sort of tautology. But anyway, six one six three seven five. 3 um, Brody played really well. Georgie, we might talk about this a bit more later in the week, but in case we don't, Brody's got Casper Rude in the next round. I'm not writing him off in that at all. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not either. I I think Rude. I do wonder if we're just underestimating him too much now, though. In the way <laughs> where the grass is becoming more and more like a hard court, that actually, I I don't know how often I'm actually looking at Rude in the slam. Wimbledon is probably the one slam I'm looking at him thinking. Oh, he's quite vulnerable, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not hugely optimistic. I hope I'm wrong. Right. I do hope I'm wrong. So he, he won think... his first round and dropped a set to the world number one nine nine, and it's only the fourth time he's ever won a match on grass. Just that's. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, George, I will definitely be picking that match for um, prediction. Yeah, so you one. are going to. I'll, I'll to... think on it a bit further. You, yeah, you yeah. put me on the spot too early there. I'll, I'll go back <laughs> and forth in my head, and we'll see where I land. Um, very finally, and last but most certainly not least, because um, people sometimes forget about him, Jan Choinsky. Uh I mean, came from behind to beat Dusan Lejovic. Like I, like, honestly, I saw him lose the first set, and I thought, well, that's that's that. I mean, no one, not many people know much about Jan Choinsky anyway. He's pretty green at this level. Like, well, people don't like you know he he was yeah. he represented Germany until 2018, you know he's just someone who's kind of just completely gone under the radar for so many people. I think this is his first time ever in the main draw of a Grand Slam, and he's gone out and won a match. And it's like bloody well fair play, mate. Like you you know he didn't we did press with him on either Saturday or Sunday, and you know he talked a bit. His his mum was a professional ballet dancer. She danced at the Royal Ballet in London, and she's from Southampton. That's how he qualifies to play for Britain. Um, yeah, he's just like, you know, he's been given a wild card. Uh, he's, I think, doubled his career prize money by winning that match. And it's like, yeah, fair play, mate. Like, you've you've backed it up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, we were talking about kind of wild cards weren't we, the other day and how they give players the opportunity to get that win of a lifetime and kickstart their career and he, he he's done it and we spoke about yeah lie a bit earlier this year didn't we being a giant slayer he's got a really good record recently against top players well he's uh he's felt that feeling himself today even though mm. he's far from the strongest grass court player i would well yeah so but it, I, still I also, a great win hmm, i also know he's not you know he's got the single-handed backhand um i know he's not been he's taken the grass rail too seriously i saw him hitting with um i think he was hitting with arthur ferry up at the boodles i think it was arthur ferry um just you know because he played one of the days at the boodles as well but he was up there for quite a few days preparing and you know i i, I think he has taken it fairly seriously and, and he's a canny operator and he's been around a long time and as you say george you know grass is not necessarily grass at wimbledon um but anyway interesting to see what what 
what Yan can do next. Uh, he's in that bottom bit of the drawer. He's got he's got the man coined at the uh, drawer of Wimbledon as Herbert Hercatch. Um, unfortunate slip of the tongue there from referee Jerry Armstrong. Yeah. Her- Hercatch is one who's just gone completely under the radar, isn't he? Really, I mean, he 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 shows some great form here the other year. He, he's one of the players who actually falls in that bracket of someone who looks quite natural on grass and plays mm. some pretty good stuff, but his form's not quite been there for a while has it really so. i'll tell you how under the radar he went george because i saw him today walking to his court behind albert ramos Vignolas and with like it was through the very busy bit under the bridge you know between mm. center and the media center and there's obviously a few security around just to like help them get through and the security guard like got in between the players as in like he got in between ramos Vignolas and her catch and sort of like blocked her catch out because he didn't realize he was a player <laughs> which is like it's bad because obviously her catch is like one of the few people dressed all in white and he's also absolutely enormous like yeah. you can't really miss him and it's but also yeah. mildly funny because it's like you know ramos ramos vinolas you wouldn't really say is the uh, no exactly world's he's... greatest star <laughs> <laughs> the other way around would probably be more forgivable I yeah exactly so anyway. um but yeah he made it through in straight sets for for what it's worth um Right, I've got to ask you for your predictions, George, uh, for yeah. day two. Uh, I'm going to... I was going to edit in Calvin's voice note explaining his predictions, but it wasn't super long, um, so <laughs> I don't know if that's actually worth my time. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that we the matches we're picking are Murray versus Peniston, Bolter versus Savile, Norrie versus Mahatch, and uh, Krachikova versus Watson, as I've gone all Brits today. Uh, mm. Calvin has... No, I'm not going to tell you, George. I've already written mine down. Calvin's already picked his, so you have to pick yours without that kind of information. We're going to start okay. with Murray versus Peniston. So I'm on centre tomorrow. Um, which? And you're not delighted about it, are you? It's not that I'm not delighted. I, I think it could be fairly swift. Rebecca versus Rogers. Murray versus Peniston. Match. Yeah, and then Udvardi versus Sabalenka. I mean, God knows what what sort of Elena Rabakina is going to turn up. Like she, honestly, yeah. I watched her practice in Sabalenka and she just looked awful. She's been ill. I don't know. She might turn yeah. up and be and absolutely Rob- brilliant, but and Rogers is not a bad player. Like, yeah, gritty. Yeah. Should be okay. So yeah, I mean that one would be interesting, I suppose, from early shock perspective. Murray. I mean, normally with Murray, I'm thinking he'll somehow find a way of dragging this into five bloody sets and make it <laughs> ridiculous. But I, I kind of feel like he's going to just pump Peniston tomorrow. I don't know. I just think he's going to be far too good for him. Is that... I think the problem for Peniston is he's hit with Murray a lot. Like, it, his best chance, I think, would have been coming out, Murray not really having a good idea of the ball off his racket, and, you know, starting slow, as he often does these days. And Peniston's big lefty serve and, you know, just, just nicking the first set, you know, in a breaker or mm. something because Murray starts sluggish. But, I mean, I've gone Murray in four. Um, oh, you've taken four. I, I'm going to take three. I know, I've already written it down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you could tell. It is uh, three or four, though, isn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah. For once. Not Incident- four or five, as it no. normally is for Murray. No. Incidentally, George, you're in the lead, by the way. You've got six points. Having picked two, you picked two perfect results today: uh, Svitolina in straight sets and Sinner in straight sets. Whereas I was hedging a bit more. The Fritz Hanfman is carried over, but um, I went, I went Fritz in three. Of yeah, them, I think. Calvin unfortunately has Fritz in five, and that is in a fifth set, so um, he might pick up three. I points, really but... want Calvin to win that because I've named my fantasy team after Taylor. Fritz, <laughs> I get really annoyed if my team name does badly. Yeah, like, I had... after it's the quarterfinals at least. I was hot struff and I lost struff in like the first round of the French. It's infuriating. It's just it just says the gloss off, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Was... Um, next match for you to predict, George Bolter versus Savile. Daria Savile. People might remember her as Daria Gavrilova. Yeah, I mean, I've also got Bolter in my fantasy team, so Oof. I will be Jesus. predicting her to win. I'm really annoyed about Svitolina today. So she's probably going to bloody lose now. So I don't know whether I, whether it's a pick. Oh, there's a hedge. There could be an emotional bill. hedge yeah. here. Emotional hedge, or whether I should consolidate my great lead and uh, push <laughs> further. Now I, I do think Balter will win. Um, I think she's played some good stuff. It could be a, I think a tight two, 
So I'll go Bolter in two. Bolter so in it two. could be a three. Calvin and I have I'll both go gone Bolter in three. So make it that okay. way you will. Uh, Nori versus Thomas Mahatch. I think I'm saying that right. I just realised I haven't checked on the uh, the old ATP pronunciation guide, but Wait, I remember we have feedback. We need to get our pronunciations better. I know. James, well, here we go, George. I'm, I'm about to you to tell me off. I'm about to listen so. to it live. I was right. It's Thomas Mahatch, and I'll tell you why I know that. It's because he played Davis Cup against Britain in uh, Innsbruck when I was supposed to be there, but then Austria shot its shut its borders. Um, and he played very, very well. So uh, I, I think he's a handy player. But don't let me colour your judgment, George. Um, I think Norrie wins. Hmm. I kind of think he'll probably win it. It's another three or four for me. But equally, Norrie, I don't trust him much either. So it's three, four or five. <laughs> uh, I'll go Norrie in four, I think. Uh, it's the same as me. Calvin has greater confidence than says Norrie in three. Uh, I, I think probably I'm slightly regretting my decision when I look at Thomas Mahatch's run through qualifying, where he beat Uchida in three sets, scraped past Uchiyama, and then got a walkover against Lucas Puy. Like, he's, he's not necessarily winning many matches. Ah. That says to me he's taking Norrie in to at least five. If he <laughs> and he's fresh, James. That's yeah, all I'm, I'm, doing, I'm not so convinced. Uh, right, very finally, Barbora Kajikova, former French Open champion, against our very own Heather Watson. Um, I mean, I think Kajikova is going to win. Um, <laughs> I think she'll probably win quite comfortably in straight sets, to be honest. We are all united on that one. Maybe that was too easy a fixture for me to pick, but I felt I wanted to pick another Brit. So, um, and, and we could all do with some points. You know, points are points are good for everyone. And equally, there probably won't be that many days where we have four Brits throughout it, so we might as well get it done early. Well, the, I mean, there's a very good chance that there won't be any more days where we have four <laughs> Brits uh, in the tournament. So, yes, I think that's very sensible indeed. Um, wh- which match are you looking forward to the most tomorrow, George? That I'm watching or... Yeah, board, on, so, on centre, and then you can say beyond if you want. Uh, so, I mean, the match I'm most looking forward to from a intrigue perspectives Rebekina uh, for the for the sake of it I'll tell you my prediction for the three matches if, if you like great so I think as you say Rebekina is really hard to know what's going to happen so it's one I'm least confident about I do think she'll win so I think she'll find some resolve and get through it but I could see that going any direction I can't see anything but a Murray win but I think it'll be nice to kind of have a good atmosphere and I'm taking a friend for his 30th birthday, so I think he'll enjoy that. So I'm glad we've got that for him. Um, and then Sabalenka, I think the bet tomorrow is how many minutes she's going to do it in. And it could be as low as 45, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It could, it could, it could be pretty bad. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we live in hope. We live in hope. You never know. Um who who are you taking, George? Who you give a shout out to your thirtieth birthday friend? It's my friend Jake, who I I lived with for three straight years at university. And Crikey! Travelled down from Liverpool to. to oh, he's come made a last bit. So. Oh, well, that's yeah, nice. that'd be nice. Excellent. Well, George, I will, and I, I say this advisedly. See you tomorrow. Uh, yes, we will. And we can do a little record. Yeah, we could do a little person. pod. Maybe after one match, so you're not quite too beard up. Um, yeah, and good. we'll go and have a drink in the media bar, of course, as well. And we shall do some podcasting, and maybe even with all three of us in the same room. But in the meantime, make sure you come back for that. Sports Social Podcast Network.